Thank you. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the Rescience Journal. It has been uh, created last year by myself and Conrad Insen. And the goal of this journal is to publish explicit replication of already published research. And well, the motivation was that uh, two years ago, I needed a, a model in a, of the literature, of course, and the, the code was not available, as usual, I would say. And so I asked for the code, and I tried to, uh, to make it run, and it was very difficult. I was not able to compile it, and it was a 6,000 line of Delphi. So after three months of uh, hard work, we uh, make it a 200 line of Python. So it was really nice. It was uh, working, and the question, OK, what do we do with this? Can we publish it somewhere? So of course, we push it on a, on a GitHub to make it available, but there is just no way to publish it in a regular journal. So this was a, a motivation to create this journal. So it's called Rescience. It lives on uh, GitHub and GitHub only. A submission is a pull request and you have a public review, and so if you want to help the, the journal, you can become a reviewer. The only prerequisite is that to have a GitHub uh, account. And uh, well, if you have uh, any question about uh, this journal, come to see me. You can also spread the word, have a look at the, uh, at the journal website, and of course, you are uh, encouraged to submit a, a paper, and especially for a student, because it's a nice way to show that as a student, you are able to read a paper, understand it, replicate it, and write an article, and to publish it. Because all the articles are, are peer-reviewed, and they get a DOI up from Zenodo, and the code, article, are all available on GitHub. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Would you mind giving that exact same talk again right now? Oh. All right. Sorry. Uh, and next up uh, after is Daniel Chen, and immediately following, if Tony could come up, Tony Fast could come up and sit in the seat. So. All right, cool. So, hello, everyone. I'm Daniel. Um, I can't really see the, and what's going on. So, I'm a graduate student at Virginia Tech. Um, I'm part of the Social and Decision Analytics Lab there, and I sit, and I also work at the Network Dynamics and Simulation Science Lab there as well. Uh, I am also a instructor for software slash data carpentry. So last year, I for a lightning talk, I gave a short intro to literate programming on a system called Pweave that lets you use LaTeX and interweave your code, interweave your Python code with LaTeX, so you can have regular code, uh, regular text your Python code, your Python output, and then more text. So it's really good for writing things like your dissertation, or in my case, a book. Um, so if you want, you can, there's the links to last year's talk, and I have two repositories on um, how, how you would use Pweave, and if you want to learn how to set up child documents for LaTeX files or a LaTeX project, you can look there as well. So I am working on a book. It's called Pandas for Everyone. Um, it's through Addison Wesley in their data analytics series. Uh, it's supposed to be very similar to a book called R for Everyone that they run, which I worked with Jared Lander, the author of that book. Um, and it's supposed to be an intro to Python for data analytics. And James Powell, numerous times in the past, talks about how Python's a really strange language in that there's the programming side of it and the analytics side of it, and the, the way you code it up is really different depending on which, which path you're going down. And so, as a software carpentry instructor for the past three years, I've learned a lot about how to teach people, and I have the pleasure of teaching everyone who sits around me at work. So we start off with chapter one with how do you load up a data set and it's pretty much the quickest way to get you to a plot. Um, that's the use case to get people motivated, so that's chapter one. Um, then we go into just the, a little bit more detail about what's going on um, between, um, with the underlying data structures. And then chapter three is just a whole thing on plotting and you should be able to do everything all of the basic statistical plots by the end of chapter three. So pretty much by the first, I think it's like 
90 pages of the book, you should be able to be able, you should be able to have something like an Excel sheet and work your way through uh, creating a plot for Python. So the whole goal really is supposed to, you're supposed to be able, the goal is to use this book as a, um, as a book that you would use for like an intro to programming class or something. So um, each chapter roughly, you can probably teach in about 45 minutes to an hour. So they're broken up like that. And before I go on through the whole entire table of contents, one important thing that stems from Eric Ma's talk last year and what my lab does regularly is testing your data or testing your code to make sure what you expect in your data is correct. So you don't have things like pregnant males um, in your data set, or if you're working with um, administrative data, you don't have a person that's male for their entire life and random blips of female entries in there, which is, if that's what you expect, okay, but you, you, know, you might wanna check for that. And that's it. Um, so you can find me there. That's my Twitter and GitHub username, so thanks. Thanks, Daniel, I think it takes all kinds. All right. Uh, Tony is up next, and then after that, we have, uh, if Marius could uh, come up. Oh, they're already here, great. So, where's the, uh, did you walk off with the, oh, there's it. Brad. Okay, excellent. Uh, so first of all, uh, I wanna give a presentation from the Jupyter Notebook, but uh, I think running through the vertical part of the notebook is a little bit tedious, so let's whip up a presentation uh, using MB present. Uh, so now uh, every single cell that I have in my notebook is turned into a presentation slide, and let's get going. So I wanna talk about scikit-learn models. Uh, I wanna talk about running all the models. There's so much to know in scikit-learn that it's really difficult to imagine figuring out the best solution uh, for me as an individual. So how do I use all of the work that, that folks have uh, uh, contributed to scikit-learn and figure out what the best model is to solve a problem? So all models are wrong, but some are useful, and now a lot of them are reusable, um, and that's really powerful to me. So this was inspired, uh, this research and uh, this little investigation was inspired by a project called Teapot. Uh, Teapot uses uh, genetic algorithms to try different combinations of models using scikit-learn pipelines and feature unions. Uh, it uses the genetic algorithm to optimize hyperparameters that best solve a classification problem. So while uh, Teapot is running, what it's doing is it's trying different combinations of scikit-learn models. So as this graph's moving along, what it's doing is it's passing the same data set through different pipelines of scikit-learn models. It's running many models at the same time. So I can only dis decide on one model myself, so how do I start to use scikit-learn on the aggregate to, solve, to, to understand what models are best to start with? So as we move forward, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look for all the base classes in scikit-learn that are transformers, regressors, and classifiers. So after we do that, we find that there are 160 estimators in scikit-learn. 71 of them are transformers, 38 of them are classifiers, and uh, 45 of them are regressors. And that's not, then we can add on top of that all of the extended projects for scikit-learn. So if you have a scikit-learn model, it can be plugged into any arbitrary pipeline and you can try any combinations of models that you might like if they've been prepared as a scikit-learn model. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the uh, handwriting data set, we're gonna take the digits uh, that's built into scikit-learn, and uh, here's a little bit of metadata about the, uh, the digits, and Here's an image of the training data. So the digits data set is a collection of handwritten uh, numerical values between zero and, ten, zero and nine, and we all know this, and I'm probably boring you with this part, but we are going to, put, we are going to run this data set against all the models in scikit-learn. Uh, we're gonna stop the models at two seconds. So now we have run 
in, in 34 seconds by taking all of these classes and running the same data set through a bunch of different models. In 34 seconds, I ran, I, we were able to run 46 models with 18, on 1,800 rows of data and 64 features. There is no way that I could get that efficiency on my own. So by automating this in late, uh, with using, using time uh, that I have, using time while I'm thinking about my science and thinking about my work, I can have, I can have uh, the models, or models queued up. And the, uh, in 34, yeah, so there's a lot of models. So how do we start to look at that? Uh, so I'm gonna pass the models through Bokeh. And now what we're looking at is we're looking at all of the models, uh, or the first two principal dimensions of all the models um, for 15 of those choices. And there's 45 different models. Uh, so what does visualization offer here? Uh, clearly some of these models like linear uh, SVC and uh, negative matrix factorization and dictionary learning are offering some kind of separation here. But how do we know uh, what, what values separate out better, what features can be described by these models um, separately? So if we were to take some of the interactive bokeh tools, we can see where these different collections of points lie. We can see that some of the models that we're using fit certain numbers better. Um, and when we're zooming in on these values, uh, we have linked brushing. And since these are digits, uh, each of the glyphs are numbered. So we can see that the number zero and the number five are found here. Uh, we can use the tap tool and start exploring uh, different points and seeing where they might lie in other embeddings. Uh, so now we've and created- I hope everyone feels awesome. the learn. <laughs> Jupiter to Atlanta. All right, <laughs> Marius, you're up next. And uh, after Marius, we'll have Jonathan Helmus if you want to come up. Do you have an HDMI connector? There was an HDMI connector up here. Uh, what's that connected to? Not? Wasn't that one of the It wasn't working, so did it just like totally disappear? Yeah, I guess it must have taken Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, okay. We'll, we'll switch. Jonathan. Cool. No time penalty. Okay, so uh, I am Jonathan Helmus, and I'm going to be talking about ConduForge. So um, I have a problem. When I go to a conference like this, I hear about a lot of cool tools and Python libraries, and then I go back home and I try and install them, and I see something like this. So error unable to find vcvarals.bat. Now, some of you have never seen this. Turn to the people at your table, ask them which one uses Windows, ask them what this means. Um, if you use Windows, a proper response is, is because you have to, your employer makes you, plus it's getting bashed now, so it's good. Um, so you say, well, just build everything from source, but that's really hard, and that's why we chose Python. It's not compiled. It's supposed to be easy to use. Um, so what we really want is some kind of tool that makes this really easy to install binary packages. And Maybe, you know, we want it cross-platform. We want to be able to use it on everything. Uh, probably shouldn't require root or admin because I don't have that. And, you know, it should just work. And by that, I just mean, you know, dependency resolution, Python 2, Python 3. I want it, you know, everything like that. Uh, also, I kind of want to know where the stuff that it installs came from. So I want to know where those packages are built and maybe be able to reproduce them if I really wanted to. And finally, you know, it would be nice if it could like create environments so that I could have a Python 2 environment, a Python 3. So that tool does exist. It's called Conda. Um, so it's a cross-platform package and environment manager. It's open source. Uh, it doesn't require administrative uh, permissions to install. It was designed for any type of software, but it has very nice Python-specific enhancements. Uh, and it was created by the nice folks at Continuum Ana Analytics. Now the question is, where do you get all the packages? Well, Continuum provides a lot, a number of them, but 
Some of them, you know, maybe not the one that you really like. Um, maybe the one that you do like is a little out of date, or maybe they compiled it with slightly different uh, configurations than what you like. And so a bunch of us created ConduForge, which is a community-led collection of recipes, build infrastructure, and packages. We're up over 800 packages from 150 contributors. The entire organization is open and transparent. We have meetings. We uh, give you those meetings, uh, the meeting notes. Everything is built on GitHub. There's one repository called a feedstock per package we build. And then uh, the builds happen on various continuous integration platforms. And then everything gets uploaded to ConduForge. So this morning's keynote actually gave an example. So Conda install, ConduForge, Altair gives you Conda. Um, but I'm going to do a lightning talk inside of a lightning talk if my machine will let me. So uh, this isn't on ConduForge, unfortunately. Um, it hasn't been merged yet. But this lightning talk is what's new in Python 3.6. So um, Python 3. Point, oh, I have to activate. Source. Nope. Don't do that one either. So Python uh, 3.6 alpha 3 was released yesterday. Um, and if you were like, hey, what's new in Python? So you have F strings, which are this nice little thing that lets you rewrite your hello world in two lines. Um, the other thing is you have date time. <laughs> um, oh, wait. Uh, dun, dun, dun. So uh, we'll do a now. So date time change, so you can now do really strange things like this. If you ever wanted to know what week it was, um, that, that's a nice feature. I have no idea why you would use these. Um, but it's going to be on ConduForge by the end of the week in a pre-release channel. ConduForge does allow that. We just use different channels instead of having some crazy flag like pip. Um, <laughs> so. So uh, I'm not going to make these big, but uh, kind of forward, you can find these slides. Um, Philippe is going to talk next, I believe, or in a couple talks on how you actually make a package. But you can find our packages on GitHub. Um, we talk on uh, Gitter. And we're going to be sprinting both Saturday and Sunday if anyone wants to come join us. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, all right, so you want to try again, Marius? It's Oh, even better. OK. And um, yeah, after that is going to be Philippe, if you're around. Oh, oh yeah. OK. Uh, that went. Uh, with Yeah. Oh gosh, I can't see. Um. Setting a new standard here. Ah, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, I'm going to talk about Spylon. It's a small little sort of hacky thing that I've sort of whipped up a few days ago. Um, the, the, idea of the, the idea of it is, um, is frequently when you're writing some Spark code, um, and you were, write, were writing a lot of my, nice Python things, and now you find it's really slow because you were writing UDFs. So first, first thing is, you know, so I have some slow stuff. So let me just throw away all my Python code and rewrite in Scala, right? That's what, it's like, initial thought. That's obviously a terrible idea, and you shouldn't have to do that. So rather than, you know, rewriting it, you know, rewriting everything, just rewrite the little bit that's slow in Scala because, you know, the JVM is a thing that Spark likes, apparently. So fine, just deal with it. You can, you can do the pain. It's not that bad. It's actually a relatively nice language. I know it's sort of heretical to say that here, but whatever. Um, so 
Uh, I wrote Spilon. It's a sort of weird pompanue of the names of Python and Scala at the same time. And so it's just a sort of a set of helper functions to make it slightly easier to work with Scala from inside Python. So PySpark works via this magic little thing called Py4j that allows you to actually have a real sort of Java inside, inside your Python. So you can actually use that to do a, a whole bunch of magic things. Um, unfortunately, it's built extremely heavily on Java, and if you're using Spark, you want Scala types. So this sort of provides you a lot, uh, with a lot of sort of general utility conversions of like, I have a Python list. I'd like to have a sequence, please. Um, by default, you know, Py4j will do other things, and that's not actually what you want. So getting it, it's on Conda Forge, like everything. Um, and if you want to clone the GitHub repository, um, it's at github.com GitHub slash maxpoint slash spylon. Um, so a couple of features. So easier conversion to and from, well, right now just to from is pending, but will probably be done soonish. Um, and there's a couple of, of strange things in terms of like how Scala compiles itself to Java classes. They have slightly different names because Scala has a richer sort of object system than, than Java has. So there's a couple of little hacks that you want to, that this provides that is really awful code that no, no person there in, in the right mind should ever want to write themselves ever again. So I wrote it so other people don't have to. It's like, if the, if the term JVM reflection inside Python scares you, it should. <laughs> um, and also, it, because this is sort of heavily focused on Spark, it also provides a better launcher for PySpark inside notebook usages. Uh, notably, um, it provides you with things like tab completion for Spark properties. Um, Spark has something like 200 odd properties you can set that subtly change its behavior. And by default, you have to go look, go read the documentation for all of that all the time. Um, that's tedious. We're software people. We can just look it up in a dictionary and just store that in a nice way. Um, thanks. If people want to check this out, um, it's av stuff's available at github.com slash max, uh, maxpoint slash spylon. Um, I work for maxpoint. We do some cool sort of ad techy stuff using Spark and all the Python data stack stuff. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. I think we all needed more best being gas. Uh, all right, so next up is Philippe and, Felipe, and uh, after that, uh, Tom Rubitai, are you around? If you could come up. Yeah, I think it's working. It tries to send a signal, but it gets, it gets back uh, here. Nope. It should be this one. Let me see. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Let's try this one. There, oh, yeah, there, well, yeah, it was just on the wrong screen. So. Huh. So this is going to be a lightning, lightning talk, very short, because Jonathan was the good cop. He was here to tell that Conda Forge is nice. I'm going to be the bad cop. I'm here to tell you that don't ask what Conda Forge can do for you. Ask what you can do for Conda Forge. We are a community, and we need help. Um, so first step, go to our website and see what packages we have. And I mean, we have about 700 packages, and those are hard to compile binaries. We're talking Fortran extensions, C++ extension, C extensions. We are talking GDAL, NetCDF, HDF5. We're not talking about 80,000 pure Python packages that you can beep install on your phone. And so it's a small amount of packages, but 
they're important. So when you find a package, use it and report errors. And when you're reporting errors, do like that. Send a small snippet with an example, we're producing the error so we can actually have something to work with. Uh, but what if the package is not there? Or, or if the package is outdated? So clone that feedstock, update the package, all you have to do is to update the version, the checksum, and if the dependence changes, you have to change the dependence and send a PR. But what if the package is not there? So that's the last step and the most complicated one. You have to fork stated recipes. That's our entry point. Uh, you're probably going to need our tool that's called Conda Smith. From Conda Smith, all you really want is the recipe linter to check your recipe. And check our examples before asking any questions and help us improve our example, or better yet, sprint with us and help us improve Conda Skeleton so we don't need that example. And if you don't use the linter, that's going to happen. Our bot is going to scream at you, saying everything that's wrong with your recipe. And just a little bit extra. So if you want to do Conda Forge like a pro, use the re-rendering when you're re-rendering a new recipe. Or if you want to Conda Forge like a ninja, download our Docker image and build the package before submitting the package. And if you want to do Conda Forge like a boss, participate in our meetings. You know, it's all open. It's on the hackpad. We, we do Google Hangouts every two weeks. And that's pretty much it. Thank you, Felipe, for that Conda foraging. Thank you. Um, and Tom is up next. And then after that, Rich Signal. You're right. If you want to come up. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Python 3 for scientists, which is a small project uh, that I've been working on with uh, several other people below. Let's see, sorry, this failed. Um, which is, so it's a project we've been working on in the last few weeks um, on and off. It's a small project. Uh, but the idea is to essentially encourage um, scientists to migrate to Python 3. So I'm not sure what's going on here. Okay, right. Um, what is Okay, well, it'll flash, so the message will go in better. Great. Okay, so we all know, and we, so we all know that basically the um, my 2020 Python 2 will drop support. Uh, uh, Python will drop support for uh, well, Python 2, and that you know by then people should be using Python 3. Um, and so, and in the scientific Python ecosystem, uh, people are already starting to make decisions uh, about essentially dropping support for Python 2 in uh, future releases. Uh, for example, we heard this morning from Brian that uh, IPython 5 uh, will, uh, this is really, you know, sinking in, uh, IPython 5 will, uh, blinking warning, not support, uh, is, is supporting Python 2, but will no longer, uh, IPython 6 will no longer support Python 2. Um, so, there must be a problem with the keyboard. Okay. The, um, there's also something called the Python 3 statement, which is a statement that projects can sign up to. Uh, which essentially where they pledge to, to drop support for Python 2 by 2020. Okay, now what about users? So what happens to, to the actual scientific uh, user, Python users, uh, just average researchers, are they ready to switch to Python 3? Well, one of the main issues is that uh, they have to essentially um, put up with a lot of comments that you know, developers, including myself, have made in the past. Um, such as, you know, we say things like legacy Python, which is not really a nice thing to, to say in the, in the sense that it's trying to shame them into upgrading to Python 3. Um, we also say things like, oh, well, you know, Python 2 won't be supported anymore in, in um, you know, in 2020, and so you should upgrade now. Uh, there's only a few years left, so you should update as, as soon as possible. Um, and then also we say things like, well, it's going to be painful to switch, but you should switch now and not later because it'd be even more painful. Okay, so I'm saying, uh, and, and the point of the, the Python 3 for scientists is to say, we don't want to do negative campaigning. We want to try to, uh, instead of essentially saying things uh, that are uh, bad about Python 2, let's focus on uh, the positive aspects of Python 3. <laughs> okay, so um, there, there's several things we can do. So we can provide compelling features that will be useful for scientists for day-to-day -day work that exist in Python 3. Now, what I mean by that is there's a lot of really nice features in Python 3. The problem is that uh, the, the people that are here probably are not necessarily interested in the same ones 
as people who are just the kind of average typical scientist uh, doing just who wants to do some work, they won't care about async I/O. They won't care about yield from. Those are very useful features for packages, but they're not going to be useful for the average uh, scientist. And so we need to find essentially features that we think are actually going to be convincing for for uh, essentially scientists to use. Um, we also need to provide transition uh, inform information about transitioning to Python three. And um, so, again, that's something where we have to be very careful to distinguish between things that are useful for developers and users. The average, scientific, uh, the, the average scientist does not need to essentially have scripts that work on both Python 2 and 3. We just need to provide information for them of how they can write new scripts in Python 3 while still being able to run their old scripts in Python 2. Um, and so it's very important to make sure that we distinguish between those different use cases. And there's a lot of information on the web right now about Python 3, but unfortunately a lot of it contains things that are essentially not going to be useful for the average scientist. So we've developed a, a web page uh, called, uh, a set of pages called Python 3 for Scientists. Um, and the idea is to essentially do this, to try to separate, to try to have uh, one place where you can point scientists to, uh, to essentially say, look, if you're interested in Python 3, you know, you should read this and find out what you can use in Python 3. Um, I'll tweet out the links to you after. Uh, we also want to st provide information on essentially how they can transition to using Python 3, how they can use, you know, conned environments and things like that. Um, and so, uh, but it's, it's by no means complete. It's a work in progress and it'd be great if many of you actually want to contribute to this, suggest more things that we could include in the useful features for scientists. Um, and I'm just going to leave this up here uh, as a blinking link. Uh, it's like the blink tag, basically. Um, and so it's, it's basically, it's bit.ly slash pi3 for sci. Um, that's the GitHub repository, and it also has the link to the read the docs uh, page there. So I encourage you, please, uh, we want feedback, and we want uh, contributions uh, to these pages. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And here I thought Flash was a security vulnerability. Um, <laughs> only kidding about that one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Rich is up next, and then after that, we have Yu Feng. If Yu Feng can come up. Oh, great. Thanks. Oh. Don't touch it. Okay, I have five minutes to convince you that uh, catalog driven workflows are cool. You're probably wondering what the hell those are. Um, I'll show you by giving you an example. Um, so, about a year ago, on a Wednesday, we got a call from the organizers of the Boston Light Swim. And these are folks who, they go off and they drop in a bunch of swimmers out by that lighthouse there, and they swim along that red track for eight miles uh, into the beach in Boston Harbor without a wetsuit. And they wanted to know, how cold is the water going to be on Saturday when we do our race? So I had given them uh, an IPython notebook, and they don't know Python, but they can change the times, and they can you know, run, run all, and they, can, they get a picture at the bottom, and they, and they did this, and then they called us up, and they said, oh my god, the water is going to be really cold. It's going to be 54 degrees out there? And I said, well, that's the, what the forecast model says. That's the best model we have. And they said, well, how good is that model? And we said, uh, I don't know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we thought, well, what can you do to help these guys out? And, uh, and so we'd been doing this work within the uh, U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System, which is a, uh, a microcosm of all the kind of issues we have trying to bring different data from models and sensors together in the, in the geo community. Um, all these folks in different regions, they run different models, have all these different sensors, and they want to integrate them somehow. And so what they decided to do is say, if you want to play in IUC, you have to provide a web service for your data. Okay, so all these folks are running standardized web services from OGC or from the community, and we take the metadata from all those different uh, servers, and we put them into a centralized database, and so th that metadata then has the endpoints for those data services that we understand. And we use uh, a variety of catalog tools, but the one we're actually going toward now is PyCSW. So CSW is the catalog service for the web from OGC. It's very easy to install. It ingests all that metadata, and then you can do pretty sophisticated queries against it. So um, we had, and then we, and then in our notebooks to interact with the uh, CSW service, we do use OWS lib. Okay, so we already had a catalog that we, we already had a notebook that was using a catalog to do uh, water level comparisons along the U.S. So basically the user enters in a geospatial and temporal extent, says what key words they're looking for, like what kind of, what variable, like uh, water level. And then it does a query against that CSW database. It finds all those records that meet those criteria. And then it, it starts extracting data from those endpoints that it finds within the metadata. 
So uh, we, we had that notebook already. So we said, well, let's just, you know, let's just take the same notebook and change water level to sea surface temperature and see how well that works. So, um, and this is done with Philippe and uh, Kyle Wilcox. And, um, and so basically, you know, it, it, you can go get these notebooks. I'll give you the link at the end. But basically, you enter in a bounding box, temporal extent. Um, here's a, in the middle of this is a, actually at the bottom in cell four. Uh, there's a CSW endpoint, okay? And then we issue this complex request. We get back the URLs, and we just start processing through extracting. So we find all the sensors that have sea surface temperature. We find all the models that are running that have sea surface temperature forecast. And then the, the notebook extracts the data from those models, interpolating onto the time base, so we can do one-to-one -one comparisons. And at the end of the day, we have a nice little folium plot here with some MPL uh, D3, and uh, that pops up this little chart. And uh, you can zoom in, and you can pop around to the different stations and see how well these models did. And lo and behold, we found out, this is in temperature in C now, that, the, that our model, that was the best resolution model, actually had a significant bias. That purple line is the data. Uh, our red line was the model. And it was off by almost six degrees, C, uh, C, yeah, four degrees C, so like seven degrees F. So um, we just uh, applied a bias correction <laughs> and, and, and gave them the PDF, and they were totally happy. But uh, you know, we also went back to the modelers, and uh, we said, hey, what's up with your model? It turned out they had a heat flux issue, which they fixed, and now the model's working much better. Um, so um, you know, so it was a very happy story. Um, and I just want to say, so you know, it, it's really cool about these workflows because you can. Um, you run them again, and you'll pull in like a new model that somebody had just contributed you know, to the catalog, right? So you run it one day, you get three models. You run it another day, you get four models. You get another sensor that somebody had. And it's very cool you know, to, to see, have this dynamic ability to find the data and then access the data through these standard services. So go, you can go try it out for yourself. It's on GitHub. Um, and it's uh, got the binder link down there, which will work as long as you know, binder is up. So thank you very much. Cool story, Rich. Um, all right, so up next is Yu Feng, and then uh, after that, we have uh, Chris Calloway. too much time to trying to show the slides. That's not good. All right, yeah, yes, wonderful, 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 yes, okay. So, uh, yes, I'm here to talk about this uh, shared MAM package. It's a, different, a slightly different way to approach multi-processing in Python. So, uh, let's see. So, the problem I want to address is um, Python multi-processing the module is great, except it doesn't really work. Right, so when you write this very simple and naive program, you expect, expect it to work, but it doesn't. It just tells you, well, attribute error with a traceback, and why? Well, and why, why? It's because, it's because well, uh, the standard library is committed to a bunch of things that's very important, like supporting non-fork platforms like Windows, right? Well, what is a fork? Fork is important in this context is because Fork, it creates this, uh, a copy of the current running process, and it will run from there. So by definition, all of the existing data is copy on write, so you get all of the functions and data you defined, and also before the fork, you can define some shared segments, so you can write your data back to the original process. And this is important, this is very useful, but some operating systems like Windows just doesn't have it, and if the multiprocessing library it's committed to support those systems, then you can't make use of these nice features of fork, and therefore you, are, you have to share the data with the pipes and pickles, and it forces you to write programs in a non-Pythonic way, like uh, declaring functions uh, on the module level. And in addition, the multi-processing library doesn't really give you a way to access those like uh, shared arrays with, uh, uh, with, with NumPy. So, Given these things, so here I'm saying, well, I have, well, I made this like a package as a solution. So basic idea is, okay, if we value, value our data more than the operating system, then we can afford to give, make some compromises. Like, so we can make it, only use the process and the queue in multiprocessing because they actually do the forks. And, uh, and because we use the fork, we can now define the functions anywhere in the program. 
like in a function, the Python way, and uh, the data we share between the master process and the, and the slave processes is zero copy because it's just a, like tweaking the, the page, right, the page table in the, in, in the CPU. So, and also we can define this write, writable shared memory, NumPy arrays, uh, to, to write, write back the results to the master process. So also, in addition, if we are not using the multiprocessing, we can also think about a few even more interesting things, like uh, we can borrow some ideas from OpenMP. Like in the pool, we can define critical sections and uh, require the pool to, to have ordered execution. If you use o OpenMP, I guess you know what I'm talking about, like the ordered uh, pragma in OpenMP. And also, we can borrow some ideas from MapReduce, like uh, inserting an explicit reduce step such that it is guaranteed to run on the main process. So it runs on the main, but not runs on the slave, so you can actually reduce the data that's processed by those processes from the forks. So here is an example, I made this really quick, it's counting the words from files. So basically if you use this, uh, well, use this shared, the, the map reduce object or the pool from shared, shared mem, well, you can do the, the thing you expect it to work. You define the work function and use it. It works, right? And well, we can also do it a bit more complicated way, like with the critical section and write back the result. And you see, uh, we, define the, uh, we define the result as n, which is a shared variable, and now we can store it in a critical section to increment it, and in the end, well, we get the right result. It's a shared memory, it's a memory map. So, and also we can do it with the map reduce way, where, well, each worker returns the number of words, and the, the reduce function write it to a regular NumPy array because it's on the master process. You don't have to write, write back to a shared segment. So we can do all, all of these things. So, well, I, I would say, well, I encourage you to check it out. If you Google shared mem, it's uh, the top uh, item on, on, the, on Google, and uh, it's very simple, intuitive, and uh, it's quite express, expressive, I think. If you don't want something super heavy low, ha, 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 like heavy lifting, then this is the thing. Thanks. Karen is there. Thank you so much, you. Right on time. Uh, so up next we have Chris Calloway, and then after that will be Ryan Grout. If you're around. I see you talked to me earlier. Okay. Thanks. So I have no slides because I want you to listen. Um, I'm here to tell you about PyData Carolinas, which is the latest addition to the PyData conference series. It's taking place September 14th through the 16th. Um, at IBM in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Um, that's between Raleigh-Durham and Chapel Hill. Um, so this, uh, this conference series um, is, uh, has a call for proposals. It's open currently through July 24th, and I'm particularly looking for tutorial proposals. But let me tell you why this, this particular conference is, is, is important, because the PyData series um, of conferences is dedicated to a number of things. First of all, Python and data science. I shouldn't say first of all, because it's as much dedicated to diversity in Python and data science as anything else. And we have a special condition going on in North Carolina right now. We have a, a law that's been passed in our state called HB2, which specifically under, under legal statute uh, discriminates against transgender uh, people. And so uh, this, is, this has inspired a, a nationwide backlash against North Carolina. Businesses are pulling out. Uh, musicians are canceling their concerts. And uh, conferences are, are pulling out of North Carolina. So a, a lot of people have asked us, well, why are you continuing to do this in North Carolina, uh, given this situation? Uh, why aren't you doing it somewhere else? And, and the answer for us is, we live here. We have to live with this, and we have to do something about it. And so Pi Data Carolina is, is very much dedicated this year to um, fighting um, HB2. Uh, we're providing uh, gender neutral bathrooms for all, all our conference locations. Our hotels are on this, all our, all our um, social venue locations. And it's going to be a great conference because we, it's fully catered by IBM. We have social events in the evening. Um, it's going to be a big time space for 400 people. So I hope you join us at Pi Data Carolina. I'll be here at the conference uh, around. If you have any questions about it, be sure and let me know. And go to pydata.org to find out more about it. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. All right, so up next is Ryan. And then the last person staging is Mike Draco, if you're around and ready today. So. All right. Thanks so much.
Um, Yes, let's hope it does. Yay, okay. Uh, let me put this in front here. And let me start my timer. Okay, um, my name is Ryan Grout. Um, and I'm going to talk about something that I've worked on uh, in my spare time a little bit over the last month or so. And it's a convenient interface to Conda ends and Conda packages in your package source. Um, my background is um, I'm a contributor. Um, to Conda and Conda build. Um, when I was at Continuum, I used to uh, create and update packages for the Anaconda Python distribution. Um, and I'm also looking for employment. <laughs> um, so motivation for this package was I wanted, needed a nice interface to help me find out things about the packages in my package cache and uh, how they were linked to my environments. And I wanted a collection of just elements that I could assemble um, as I needed them. Um, and other times, I just wanted to know information about packages and environments. Uh, so I wrote this package. Um, and what it aims to do is provide a nice interface around environments and around packages in your package cache um, plus a set of common utility functions, and um, also be designed to be independent of, but completely complementary to Conda. Um, so it doesn't make any calls out to Conda, doesn't import Conda, um, and reads everything basically from the file system. So, small little demo, which will be mostly a walkthrough of my notebook. Um, so uh, we have objects that will encapsulate an environment and tell me things, or let me access directly metadata from that environment. And the same for packages in the package cache. Um, this is just uh, uh, some initialization stuff. Um, these, anywhere you see root ends and root packages, these are the paths that are being referred to, which are my uh, Miniconda uh, install paths. Um, so, first, create my collection of packages, uh, then collection of environments. Uh, these objects are cached, and so it's important that you reuse them um, because all the file reads are cached, so I only touch the file system once. And these are what package info objects look like. So this one represents Alabaster 0 0.78. Um, and then this environment represents my root environment, and this one represents uh, an environment I have called Atom Image. Uh, so inside a package object, we can access its index directly. Um, we can do nice little uh, comprehensions like this. Uh, for example, to find all the packages in the cache that are licensed under the MIT license. Um, you can access index with anything. If it doesn't exist, it'll just return none. So that makes these um, possible, so you don't get an exception in the middle of uh, your comprehension if something doesn't exist. Um, you can look at all the files uh, that are claimed by a package, and you can use this to calculate collisions between packages. So, for example, we can see that um, these two packages claim uh, the same file path right here, and these are common files, so I'm sure lots of packages have these files. Um, next little nice thing that you can do is um, look at all the packages that um, an environment is linked into. 
this little bit here will tell you, um, so ignore this top part, but this little bit will tell you all the packages um, that are out of date in each of your environments and what environments they're linked to. Um, so for example, we can see uh, that this old version of Backports is still linked to my Python 2.7 environment, so it needs to be updated there. Um, and just goes down through and scans through all the packages and environments and, and lets you know that. Um, yeah, and the rest of it is, so you can look into environments as well. You can look at the object log um, and everything. So we're gonna go back to here. Um, wrap up, you can install it, pip installable. Uh, I have conda packages on my anaconda.org um, channel, so you can install it from there. Uh, thanks, uh, that's the repository, my email address, and that's my LinkedIn, and you can, I would love it if you came and talked to me about some job opportunities. <laughs> thanks. What a plug. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, next up is Mike. And uh, that'll be the last one of the day. There we go. Okay. So, some of you are probably wondering what took so long for Matplotlib 2.0. Well, first of all, a little refresher on the goal of Matplotlib 2.0. Uh, Matplotlib is about 13 years old, so it's a moody teenager um, who wants to start expressing its own style and no longer reflecting the style of its parent, who is the very nerdy Matlab, right? Um, so, Thomas and I thought, okay, well, this will be a good release. We get to have a full version number for something that's going to be really easy. It's just style. It's colors. It's artsy. It shouldn't, shouldn't, should be really easy. So last year at SciPy, we started collecting ideas and plans from the community. And then uh, Thomas and I met in October and on a weekend in New York, and we thought, oh, this will be a nice little weekend project. We'll get it done. And... Uh, yeah, it, no. <laughs> Here we are, a year later. Um, so what happened? Now, I'm not going to go through a complete and exhaustive list of all the changes in 2.0. There was a lot, and I don't want to, uh, you know, lessen anybody's great contributions to it. I'm just going to go over some that turned out to be insanely large speed bumps that seemed easy. Darn, and I just lost battery. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to try and do it from memory. Ah, OK, I'll, I'll reboot, and I'll keep going by memory. 90% chance it's going to kill me. Yes, thank you. Uh, OK, so, so one of the features was we're going to change the default colors. Um, well, they're finding a plug. Oh, darn. Sorry about that, everyone. Oh, there's a plug in the podium. Ah, here it is. OK, so we're going to change the default colors. Um, and it turns out that that's a real problem, because the current default colors all have nice little short names, like B and R and G. And if you change what the default colors are, those short little names either don't work anymore or they don't make any sense, and things are still going to look old. Um, and so we had a lot of back and forth about this and eventually came up with a new syntax that instead of using B, R, G, you would use C0 for the first color in your color cycle, C1 for the second color, and that lets us not only use the updated colors, uh, we're almost here, um, 
but it'll let you define other styles and use those colors. Um, okay, is that gonna work? Okay, uh, the screen isn't mirroring. Let's try one more time. Here, just unplug it. Yeah. Okay, all right, you're all really hungry, so I'm gonna. Okay, it's coming. So, okay, so that's the default colors. Um, I really want to show you the slide for the next one because it's very hard to explain without. <laughs> Open Office is really not happy. Here we go. Okay. So that's the default color cycle. Uh, and then it turned out the, the old color cycle was hard coded a bunch of places and it took a long time to go find all of those and go th change it. So. These are all the old color cycles, and we, or these are the new ones actually, and make everything work with the new color cycles. Then we had this, uh, he's sitting here in, in the front, a uh, guy who came along and came up with a great new color map for Matplotlib, and now we want to use it as default. But it turns out that that color map really reveals an old bug that used to be, it's been there forever, but it used to be hidden by the fact that we had a really crappy default color map. Um, <laughs> It just show, goes to show you how bad it was. Um, and what we were doing is we were taking data, color mapping it, and then scaling it. And so the problem is the interpolation that happens on the color goes through color space and not through data space. And so you see you get these little artifacts like in the lower right hand corner where there's red and there's actually no red in the color map as you can see in the color bar on the right hand side. So we had to go through and rewrite completely. No, this is just styles, this is easy. We had to go through and rewrite completely the, uh, the image processing pipeline. Um, yeah, so there, there it is before and after. Um, then even simple things like dash styles, we wanted to change the default dash styles to something that looked a little more modern. And we discovered, hey, our dash styles, when you change the line width, they don't actually stretch properly. So as you get thicker and thicker lines there on the top, the left is before, the right is after, you know, things just don't look right. So we had to go find that. That turned out to be like this whole morass of interactions between line widths and dash styles. So anyway, all of this is not to make an apology for how long it's taken. This is a warning. If your code is not tested, it is broken. That is exactly what we learned through this year. <laughs> If, if you're not using it and it's not getting tested, it is broken. I'm not saying it could be, it is. Um, and that's not my quote, that pr credit to Bruce Eckel on that. We just learned it firsthand this year. Um, so anyway, go check out the Matplotlib to release candidate. Um, the documentation is already available so you can see what things look like now. It's B, oh it's B2, sorry, not RC2, it's B2. Um, it will be available on Condaforge because it is building right now, and it's already on PyPy. It says soon, but it's already up on PyPy. So go download it, check it out. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, and thanks to Continuum Analytics for funding much of that work this year. One does not simply give a lightning talk. Thank you. <laughs> all right, everybody. Uh, that concludes this session of the lightning talks. I'll see you all back here tomorrow. So and sign up, got plenty of spaces. <laughs>